as, as some of you may know, came from the Bratton Commission in 1987, and basically it is concerned about development that meets the present and without compromising the capacity and ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So, and then they sort of leave it as that. Meeting the needs of the present, as we can see, that from this uh, Human Development Index, um, we, many parts of the world have yet to catch up with the, um, what, what the OECD countries are, right? So this poverty is still very rife in many parts of the world, India, Africa, Southeast Asia, Hindu China, so on. That, I mean, everybody sort of, uh, I just want to reiterate the point. So obviously, if you see that uh, 65%, 70% of Asia uh, don't even have proper toilet facilities, clean water, which means that a lot of poverty still exists. So growth, of course, must continue because there's an obligation to help the present generation. But growth has its costs, local costs, regional costs, global costs. So the poor air quality in many Asian countries, Asian cities, and then um, in their desire to grow and so on, many countries like China, Laos and so on, they even started, well, they started building a lot of dams. And if, they are, if you're an upstream, it's going to affect the low stream users. So the dams is going to hurt some of the economies uh, in the downstream. Um, there's also the, uh, the fires in Indonesia, which causes the perennial Southeast Asian haze. And of course, the uh, carbon emissions uh, problem contributing to global warming. These are some of the uh, uh, pictures that you can see. Uh, in in look, at, look at the smog in India. And because of the, d the dams in, uh, north, uh, in South China, they have causes the, uh, <coughs> they threaten the supply of water in the south. They diverted rivers as well. And that hurts the, uh, uh, this example is the Mekong giant catfish, which is going to become extinct. And the costs of growth are also imposed, uh, not just the present generation, but also the future generation. But uh, it must be understood that society needs to pursue the twin goals of continued growth in order for what we call the intra-generational equity and also uh, to protect the environment and so on, also for intergenerational equity. But and as economists, we know there is no such thing as a free lunch, um, meaning that there are always opportunity costs. And then for that, we have to make a, a trade, we have trade-offs, we have to make good choices. Okay? And that's where we have to do a lot of cost-benefit analysis. So the first part of the talk in this very simple uh, five, ten minutes was basically to argue that we need growth. Growth comes with a cost and how therefore to manage best this cost and allow for the twin goals to coexist. And you find that many countries in Asia in particular lacks the following things. One is getting the prices right. You think the prices right is so important? Simple things like uh, uh, when you have uh, extraction of minerals and resources, when you cut trees and so on, right? It's not just the extraction cost, but also the cost to future generations ought to be factored in. And also that many countries like Indonesia and Malaysia, they have heavy subsidies on the, the fuel subsidies, oil subsidies. And so when they try to take away that fuel subsidies, there is a massive protest and so on, right? Uh, but the fuel subsidies, uh, subsidies basically distorts prices. And so the consumers, you know, they think it's uh, cheap, so they tend to consume more. Producers which uses those oil resources will also, produce, will also use more. So the prices are wrong to begin with. And so getting that prices right is very important, which many Asian governments don't, uh, don't uh, really pay particular attention to this. But when they try to pay attention to it, it's too late because... <coughs> It's like an endowment effect. You give to people, you cannot take it back. And so in Singapore, we, we are always very mindful of this behavioral economic aspect. 
And so before government will announce a new policy, they really think very carefully about it, whether to give or not to give. Eh? Give, cannot take back. <laughs> and then many countries in Asia don't do enough uh, proper cost-benefit analysis. When I first came to Singapore, actually in the mid-1980s, the, most of the policies uh, uh, decision were made on the basis of cost effectiveness. Cost effectiveness is different from cost benefit analysis in the sense that somehow a decision has already been made that it is beneficial for society to go ahead with, say, building infrastructure, a new road, an airport terminal, and so on. And all we need to do is find the cheapest way to, act, to, to, to realize it. Now, cost benefit analysis simply means that we have to look at the benefit side as well. Why do you want to build this airport terminal? Why do you want to build the road? And so you must justify the benefit side, then look at the cost side to achieve it, and then compare the benefits and costs. So a simple notion of cost benefit was very rarely practiced, even for Singapore up to the mid 1980s. And then uh, uh, things started to change from the 1995 onwards. Uh, and that Singapore began to use a lot of cost-benefit analysis, and to this day. And if you, if you look at other economies in Southeast Asia, there's hardly any uh, usage of cost-benefit analysis. And the only thing they use, the only time they use it was because when, they want, when a government wants to apply for some loan uh, from the Asian Development Bank or the uh, World Bank, and then there's a requirement that uh, they have to do some kind of environmental impact assessment or cost-benefit analysis, right? So I think a lot is lacking in, in, in Asia uh, to, to formulate, to use cost-benefit analysis. And that's something uh, which is important because many of the countries in Asia are quite poor as well. So if you're a poor country, it is even more important with the limited budget, you know, how best to spend that budget. So unless you do at least a cost-benefit analysis, you may base your decision making on other forms of uh, decision analysis. The third one is externalities and non-market goods. Well, the carbon emission is an externality, right? Noise is an externality. Air pollution is an externality. Water pollution externality. Uh, tearing down of trees is, uh, is a non-market good. Many, many uh, countries in Asia when, when they want to develop a particular neighborhood and so on, or, or they build an infrastructure, they don't care so much about whether it affects the, the trees, whether it affects the landscapes, the aesthetics of the landscapes. They don't really care. Right? So, but those are actually important to not just the protection of the environment, but also people's happiness and utility. And nowadays, as more and more Asians are becoming more affluent and educated. They will all demand a say, a participation in decision making. And so if they demand a say in decision making, they will want to care about such non-market goods as well. So that's another thing which I try to emphasize to government. And Singapore, I think, is also uh, taking attention to this aspect. Expanding market solution, we need more and more. because. Uh, if you have a non-market solution like a command and control instrument in controlling environment, then the total abatement cost will, be, will not be efficient. It will be higher than the market solution in most cases. And therefore, I think that uh, looking at incentives and how society responds to those incentives using good market solutions is best. Establishing baselines for environmental variables and so on, green accounting, is also very important because um, unless we know what is the water, water cleanliness, uh, acceptable levels of air quality, what would be the baseline level for a given society, and then any changes from the baseline can be monitored, and then we can use cost-benefit to see whether the continued growth in certain sectors ought to be reduced because of affecting significantly that baseline level. So if we don't know what the baseline level is, through collection of data and then data analysis by many poor countries in Asia, uh, Laos, Cambodia, Burma, and so on, then how do we make decisions? We have difficulty in making decisions if we don't even determine what the baselines are. So to me, the rich countries actually help 
the poor countries in Asia to, to help them how to collect good data, how to do good data analysis and so on, rather than just giving money to them. You know? So that's, that's another thing that I think we, uh, I encourage. Uh, damage schedules, I'll tell you something more about it because I've been working on that for the past 10 years and I'll tell you something later. Uh, green technology, I think is also important for uh, moving away from fossil fuel to um, uh, renewable energy. And so there is this, I think in South Korea, you are one of the earliest uh, countries or governments to, to encourage um, green growth. I think that's something that came out from 2005 or 2007. And uh, although uh, green growth and green economy is very important, and, and, and I think it's a good idea to, to move from fossil fuel to less fossil fuel dependent, and also to uh, uh, renewable energy. Green growth itself and green economy actually also uh, uh, have limitations. The limitations come from the fact that in many of the poor countries, they may not have the institutional st uh, structure to facilitate the green growth and green economy. Take for example, if you talk about mm, the usage of energy and so on, uh, you, you need the, the, the demand side, you need to, to, to have proper optimal demand side management, meaning from the consumer's participation. The consumers need to know, for example, uh, about uh, uh, how they respond to the pricing of different types of energy at different time periods. They need to know um, 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 how, how to manage their, actually their, um, their usage of those energy. That's on the demand side. And on the supply side, they have to care also about um, technologies in which some technologies are quite complicated and the coordination of different types of technologies. So it's not just a simple, I want green growth, I want a green economy. But it is at least a step in the right direction because it channels resources into this type of activities, investment in green things. And, and, and if government plays a role and is a leader in pushing this, then maybe the industry will follow. And then um, uh, consumers can also react by buying a lot of these green products. Working with stakeholders is a, a big issue. In many countries in Asia, um, they decide, government decide what to do. So if the government wants to um, have a factory, a chemical factory, they will build it. But nowadays, it's not that simple because people object, right? So, and, and there'll be a lot of uh, people demanding a say in all these things. And so this working with stakeholders uh, is important because it ensures that everybody uh, gets into the act of decision making. Although it may slow down your decision making, but I think it actually helps to get people to accept what has been decided by the central government, for example. So the first part of the talk is simply to argue that um, if this set of instruments or uh, what I call the bottom-up approach is, uh, is uh, used more by the Asian governments, then you have less a problem globally. You know, you contrast this approach to the multilateral treaties, such as the Copenhagen Accord, Kyoto Protocol, all these big, big uh, multilateral. They, by, by prescribing that the way to deal with global warming is to cut carbon dioxide emission by such and such a level, and everybody signs the agreement, by such and such a year, Everybody signs agreement. Whether you are a rich country, poor country, island country, I think it's very difficult to get everybody to come on board to agree on a common denominator throughout. And precisely because many countries in the world are at different stages of progress, development, priorities are different. And therefore, this, this dif differential priorities itself would, would make it difficult for everybody to sign that agreement. And that's why you see that in the all these big multilateral treaties, they all have their problems. So I'm saying rather than favoring this type of approach, why not we try to encourage, reward or penalize countries' environmental management systems, policies and so on. So if in a given country, if they can enact from one to eight a substantial number of these instruments, that's good. 
if a country can do that, that's good for the whole world. So start with small, build up from the bottom, go to the top. Not the top, go down to the bottom. So that's the message from the part one of the talk. The second part of the talk focuses on what are the key challenges which Asian governments are now face as they grow. I need some water. So. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much. And here I see there are uh, big challenges. One is the NIMBY syndrome, not in my backyard. That's the acronym that it stands for. Uh, I'll go through each of this. Two, the need to price green goods, which is basically non-market goods. Three, the solid waste disposal issue. Four, that as countries in Asia continue to grow very fast, they, they are bound to have issues of transboundary uh, pollution, pollution that crosses borders. And five, Asia is, of course, like the rest of the world, faces this uh, carbon emission problem. We are now contributing more and more to it, and the future uh, is uh, jeopardized if we don't try to do something about it. And so this challenge of climate change and how it impacts Asia, I think, should, of course, be a very important issue. <clears throat> but how we handle that issue, what are the important things that we can take out of the debates on that issue uh, is... Uh, to me, is very relevant rather than just accepting uh, the prescription made from the um, the I uh, <coughs> intergovernmental panel on climate change. Let's look at one of each one of them now. Well, the not in my backyard syndrome uh, is now becoming more and more prevalent all over Asia. And the idea is this that. As a country continues to grow, the country needs certain type of facilities, whether it is an airport, whether it is a landfill, whether it is a nuclear power station, whatever. They need all these facilities. And everybody agree. But as long as you don't put the facility next to my home, my village, my town, I'm fine. But if you're going to say, I'm going to build it next to you, you probably would not like it. You will not like it because it creates a lot of externality problems. It also lowers your property prices. Some people are concerned about that. It's health-threatening in some cases. So naturally, you try to push away the facility. But if you ask, do you need the facility for your country? Of course you need those facilities if you want to continue to, imp to grow economically. Okay? So in the old days, the government decide what, where to put the facility. But nowadays, in the last 10 years, governments is, uh, cannot just decide anymore because you educate the people, the standard of living has increased, people have a lot of expectation. So of course, people want to have a say now. You cannot just simply decide, I will put the landfill in town X. You can't do that anymore. And so that's why uh, uh, Asia, in Asia, you are seeing a lot of these problems. Right? Now, if you use the Caldor Higgs criterion, the efficiency criterion of Caldor Higgs, which is actually a net benefit criterion, well, usually you will pass the test. That is, <clears throat> if you're looking at cost benefit for the entire country, then if the costs are imposed locally, but nationally the gains are a lot, th then you do a, cost, a straightforward cost benefit analysis, you're going to approve the facility being located there, you see. So that's the problem of standard cost benefit analysis. So one has to think about adjustment of this standard cost benefit analysis. Uh, cannot just use the Caldor Higgs criterion to decide on such things. And <clears throat> I, and, uh, I just uh, published a paper and, in, uh, in a book uh, by... Uh, this is a book on global cost-benefit analysis by two New York University professors, and it's in the Oxford University Press. It just came out last month, and I titled it Cost-benefit analysis uh, between rich and poor countries. What is the difference? Uh, what's the difference? So it's not just a straightforward borrowing of CBA applied to the poor, uh, to the any country, uh, because you need to do some adjustments. <coughs> this uh, picture tells you what happened in Zhejiang Province in Ningpo, 
in 2012. They were opposed to the <coughs> petrochemical plant. And eventually, after all the protests, the plant was shelved. The plant is supposed to uh, be good for the economy, produce jobs, and so on. Uh, but the environmental issue became very important, and uh, the, the, the city was going to host it. There were a lot of protests. They said, why don't you put it in other cities? In Taiwan, the anti-nuclear anti protest. In Kuala Lumpur, this was a very big news the last <coughs> one or two years. This Australian company came to Malaysia and then got an agreement with the KL government to set up a rare earth refinery plant and they couldn't get it through. There were a lot of protests. Right? Um, another issue in Malaysia is incinerator. You know, when you want to burn the solid waste, <clears throat> they couldn't even find where to put in Malaysia the incinerator. They tried three towns, and all three towns, massive protests, shut down and so on. Eventually, they had to cook, uh, shelve the idea, and while they go back to the drawing books, they have to think, who are the stakeholders now? They go back, right, do all this. So, the NIMBY syndrome has become quite serious. This is in Xiamen. And this one, I think, not affects not just <laughs> Indonesia, the nuclear power plant, but also Singapore. You know, Singapore is just proximity to Indonesia, and uh, we have the vault. Uh, the proposal was to build a nuclear power plant, actually very right near a fault, and near the volcano. You know, and while the volcano is uh, dormant, it's not dead, but it's dormant. Anything can happen, and if if something happens, it is going to affect all the, the villages around that area, but also it's very near to Singapore city. So Singapore, we have no place to run or to go to, right? So that's, this NIMBY syndrome actually extends beyond the boundaries of one country and affects Singapore. Now, for those of you uh, doing graduate studies who might be interested to study more of this increasingly important literature, uh, you can look at uh, some of these papers, these seminal papers. There are a lot of uh, NIMBY literature coming from political scientists and social scientists. So there are some of these names uh, there. <coughs> One of the latest is done by Alderic. This is a Harvard uh, uh, assistant professor. He went to Japan. He stayed there one year for his sabbatical and he worked specifically on NIMBY. Uh, in Japan. Then we have a lot from the scientists, the, the engineers and so on, that writes on the technical aspects and then the mathematicians on risk perception and so on. So this involves a lot of NIMBYs that has, left, uh, has health and life-threatening uh, externalities. Then in economics literature, starting from Berkshire, Kuhnreiter did a lot. I, I published some papers in the 1990s. Uh, <clears throat> and basically, there was along the lines of Kuhnreiter and Kleindorfer, basically that how best to locate a NIMBY. So I have this, I, this model that uh, we have, let's say, five or six towns, right, where we can put the NIMBY facility. <coughs> and then we want, according to the cost-benefit rule, the town with the least social cost, in theory, should be the one that we put the NIMBY. Okay, so one simple model is simply ask them for their social costs, right? It could be seal bids, and so the one if the central government see the one with the lowest social cost, they will just put it there. Okay, <clears throat> but the all of these uh, towns would exaggerate the social cost because they don't want the facility, right? And so if they exaggerate the the, the cost then uh, government, if they want to compensate for the social cost, will have to overpay. Though that's not very efficient, right? To overpay a particular town to accept the facility when it could have been cheaper. The other thing is that it encourages the five towns to play a game, right? As we know in game theory, they'll play a game, an auction as well, auction bidding. Um, so I have a model that looks at uh, penalties. No, 
if you don't get to site the facility, then you have to pay uh, a, a penalty for it. And then the question is, how, how much will they bid uh, on this aspect? So uh, these are the earlier papers that had been written. But certainly, this is a key challenge. This one, the need to price green goods, as I said, comes from non-market goods. And this one comes about because uh, if we don't put a price on green goods, what are green goods? The, well, green things. Environment, water, air, trees, beauty, these are all green goods. If we don't attempt to put any price on it, then what will, people, what will governments do? They will take it for granted and they will just use up a lot of these green goods, right? Until the marginal benefit to having consuming a green good becomes zero, they will just use it up. That's why you need to have a pricing. Once you incorporate the pricing into the decision making, then government must, must look at it carefully. So like if noise is free, then the projects and infrastructure, they'll build all over the place, they make a lot of noise, they don't care. Right? But if you price noise, they have to pay, then they have to care. Right? So this is the idea. So you put a price. So I think uh, most of the governments in Asia uh, really need to sit up and put such prices. Now, the problem is, okay, before I, uh, this is a picture that was taken in 1992. And this area here, for those of you who've been to Singapore, is what we call the Marina South area. The Marina South area is what is today the casinos. That's where the casinos are built. Now, back in those days, it was an empty plot of land by the bay. Okay? And every year, uh, birds from Siberia would travel miles and miles, uh, thousands of miles, on the way uh, from the north to the south, past New Zealand to the Antarctica. So from the Arctic to the Antarctica. But you know, they get tired like all of us traveling. So they make a transit stop. And the transit stop would be Singapore in this area. And over time, this land was filled up with water. And there were all kinds of birds, migratory birds, actually coming to that plot, to that land. And they would spend a few days up to a week there before they fly off again. And so that attracted a lot of uh, bird, bird lovers or animal lovers. They, they would go there with their sophisticated equipment, take pictures. But, you know, in Singapore, any empty land is waste, wasted, because they always want to fill up the land, build a building, have a commercial development, and so on. And so the Urban Redevelopment Authority looked at this land and they said, oh, it's only for the birds. Who cares about the birds, right? The land can fetch, they were, they were told, like millions uh, in terms of annual leases to the government, from the government, right? So they started to move in, and then there was a lot of objection from the Nature Society of Singapore, the bird lovers, and also the general public. So it became a big issue for the first time in the early 1990s. And the government's response at that time was that, well, we do understand all these things, but what can we do? What can, how can we price the value of bird loving, bird watching? duck pond, right? And so uh, this reporter, Sharon Lowe, then scouted the universities and they found there was someone, at least, uh, who does work on environmental economics and cost-benefit analysis, and that's me. And this is me on the right-hand side. So they brought me down to this empty plot of land adjacent to the duck pond, and they say, how much is the duck pond worth? And this guy on my, this side here, is the president of the Nature Society of Singapore, and he is a philosopher. You know, philosophers are right at the other extreme end. <laughs> yeah. And so he was up in arms, you know. How could economists do such a thing, you know? Putting a price, a dollar value on bird loving, it is priceless, it is infinite value, and so on and so forth. So I basically uh, say that we are not really trying to do anything except to look at the proposal and the proposal's merits and costs and benefits and price everything so that they will be properly compared 
there's a common denominator. Otherwise, how are governments going to decide on such matters involving green goods and non-market goods? They will sit around a table of a committee and then they will look at all the commercial values, the dollar values of those things that are quantifiable. And those things that are non-quantifiable, they get a list. And then they look at the list and then they make a judgment call. Now, is that kind of method better than what I'm proposing? Forcing everybody to do a proper cost-benefit analysis? And I did not invent the methods. The methods already exist and used by governments in Australia, in UK, in US, in Canada. So why not we at least attempt to use some of these existing methodologies and then see from there, make a judgment call. Not when you don't have anything, you make a judgment call based on subjective valuation. To me, that is poor decision making. So that's all I was saying. And uh, of course, the Nature Society did not agree. Nature Society said basically, if you were to do that, then the value that you get will always be lower than a commercial value, say from a developer. But he is wrong, definitely wrong. Because the literature uh, says otherwise. This, uh, give you an example. This is an Australian wombat. Way back in the 70s or 80s, actually, um, in New South Wales, a farmer was selling a piece of land to a commercial developer for $3 million. And then they found out that on the land, there is the habitat of this creature called the wombat. And they found out that in Australia, there are only three places where there was this habitat. So unfortunately, or fortunately for this farmer, the habitat of this wombat was on his land. So there was an outpour of uh, unhappiness by the people in New South Wales and, and also people outside New South Wales. So the Nature Society in Australia did something different. Instead of getting petitions from everybody, can you please sign my signature? What they did was they asked people, can you contribute to a trust fund? I don't care how much you contribute. You may have no money, you contribute one dollar. Somebody got money, contribute more. Somebody who has strong feeling to protect the habitat, contribute a lot more. And then they didn't stop in just individuals. They go to the banks. They go to firms. All right? Some firms, we, we, we don't care whether they have genuine green causes or not, but they try to project the image that they are green. And so they create green programs, they pay for donate money to green courses. <clears throat> so are they willing to donate to save the wombats? And they did. So many banks came out with a lot of money and contributed to the trust fund. And then they didn't stop in New South Wales. They go beyond New South Wales. They go to South Australia, they go to uh, Western Australia. They ask the people there, they describe what's happening. And the people there also contribute. So the entire country actually contribute and the result is that you get substantially more money than the commercial developer you know, uh, paid uh, for this. So what does that tell you? It tells, the moral of the story is this, if you have some agency, some coordinator that goes around and collect these values from people or from firms, you are able actually to establish some values for the green goods, okay? That is being threatened by development and by growth. And so, what is lacking in most, most uh, governments, they don't do this, you see. The tree is another big issue. Do you value the tree just by how much this timber will fetch? You know, in Singapore also, we cut down a lot of trees. So, do you just base on the value of this timber values? No, right? Because a tree provides shade, a tree has historical value, a tree has aesthetic values. All this counts. So, that's the reason why I say, this pricing of green goods is very important. So, the I waste. Ask, yes, please. Ask, what was the price that you came up with for the Singaporean uh, duck pond? Oh, you're interested in the duck pond. Eventually, as you can see, the duck pond is no more. <laughs> <laughs> so it was lower than the developers? No, I was not asked to do. Okay. I was not commissioned to do any study. It was just an interview. The reporter asked me, what can we do? So I suggested, but. I think 1993, 1992 is a bit early in the game. Yeah. But now I think they would insist. Okay. Solid waste is a big issue, you know. Many countries becoming more affluent, more rich. They, they buy more things, they spend more, they consume more, they need to throw more, right? So 
again, in the case of Singapore, do you know where we put our solid waste? Not on the island. I wish we could go to Malaysia or Indonesia. I've once proposed that and I was told to shut up. <laughs> because politically it's not feasible, right? No, we, we went to an island off the south coast of Singapore. We saw three islands. We took one big island, we took two small islands. We built, it was a big engineering feat in National Geographic. You, know? you put, uh, build, go deep into the ocean a perimeter wall, combine the three islands, suck the water out between the three islands. So it become empty. Then every day, the solid waste from Singapore transported by ships to this island dump. Every 15 minutes or half an hour, every day. Now this island will last for about 2045. It's been extended already up to 2045, maximum capacity. Then what do we do? We go around hunt for another island. And you know, hunting island not so easy. Number one, the ecology of the island. Number two, the coral reef. So in the National Geographic, they show you how they transplant. They take all the coral reefs out from the island. They transplant to a nearby island and hope the fish will flow that transplant, which they did hopefully. Eh? So they did. So you see, it's a massive exercise. Billions and billions are spent. But it's a major engineering feat for, to do this. If you go to Singapore, you can request to see this island. It's called Semakau Island, S-E-M-A-K-A-U. And they will take you there. And when you arrive, you don't know at all that it's a landfill. It's beautiful. They plant trees on top. They're all mechanized below. Right? So they, they aesthetically beautify that island. But that's, that's what's happening. And so the other thing about solid waste is that uh, not all can be burned, right? So if not all can be burned in incinerators, you still got to go and have the landfill. You cannot say 100% burn, cannot. So it's still 95%, 97%. The other thing is that some people suggest uh, recycling. And then at the same time, the government suggests cut waste, cut your waste. Now, you know recycling companies, they depend on the waste. If you have no waste, they go out of business. So you see, they're all connected, you see. And, and if you encourage this, you must know how to deal with this. You cannot just both encourage it at the same time. And so that's why you have all these problems in the waste. Uh, this just, you can see on the slides, uh, the different kinds of waste, landfills. Those of you interested in your graduate thesis, you can look at the waste literature and they deal with taxation, pricing, and recycling. Okay? This gives you some of the seminal articles as well. <coughs> Transboundary, I take maybe 10 minutes. Okay, 10 minutes. Okay. <coughs> Transboundary pollution. Uh, this is uh, it's just pollution that cross borders. Okay? Now, as you know, if all the pollution are coming from one direction, then all the cost is borne by the recipient direction, not this one. And so, but if it's coming both ways, then it affects both, right? And, if it, and that's actually best. If it affects both, then there can be negotiation. If I said one way, harder for this person here to negotiate. <clears throat> Actually, this is becoming, uh, there are many examples. You have the dust and sandstorms, right? So cul culprit states, the states <coughs> that cause it from PRC, Mongolia, and it also affects themselves and then affects South Korea. And these are due to deforestation, land degradation, overgrazing, rapid industrialization. It affects health, property, livestock, estimated damage, 66 US billion in 2002. This is a big problem in Southeast Asia where you have the forest fires in Indonesia, particularly in Kalimantan, in Borneo, right? And the they, 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 they huge plantation, palm oil and so on, they cut the trees by using fire because they save money from doing that. And so the fire then burns out of control and worse, in Indonesia, many of the lands are peat. And once the fire goes on peat, it goes burn non-stop. And so this covers, you see, Kuala Lumpur cannot be seen. <laughs> this Singapore also, it's a before and after picture. In 1997 was the worst. 
you were not there, three months like this, three months. Affected flights, affected conference and business attendance, affected health, many people are sick, affected leisure and recreation, many people cannot swim, cannot run, <coughs> and this is very bad. And because of 1997, then the government of Singapore and Malaysia started to become more aggressive, <coughs> wanting a solution from the Indonesians. And to this day, they have been discussing various methods to resolve it. Uh, this is a current project I'm working on with Jinhua from Michigan State, and we are publishing a book coming out in 2014 by Edward Elgar, UK. Uh, this simply looks at all the economic issues affecting transboundary pollution. Last part, I mean, each section I could talk a lot more, but because of limited time, I'm just giving you the gist of it. The challenge of climate change. Um, this slide simply tells you that developed countries, high standard of living, affluent, what do they care next? Well, quality of life, all right? Poor countries, developing countries, some of them so poor, they don't even have proper uh, things. They, of course, care about those material goods rather than environmental goods. And global warming must be found in their mind. Eh? So they have different priorities, and therefore, uh, this creates problems. There's a lot of discussion on the science of climate change, but there's actually not so much discussion on the policy issues of climate change. There's also the question of do we do mitigation or we do adaptation? Do we reduce or we accept that the world is going to be a bit warmer? Then how do you live in a warmer world? I think the other thing that needs to be done is the magnitude of damages. Are we certain that the damage that is being published by the uh, inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is it very reliable? Because we have seen damages coming from, say, by William Nordhaus, right? Uh, it's slightly off, different. With uh, Nicholas Stern's uh, report, different, right? So if the idea is this, if the damages the magnitudes are uh, quite different from each other, then how is government going to decide how much investment they ought to fight this, uh, to put into investment on fighting climate change and global warming, right? So I think a lot of studies need to sharpen this magnitude of climate change. <clears throat> there's also from the media, there's a lot of costs on climate change being reported. No doubt, I have no problem with this. But also I think the media ought to talk a little bit more also about the the benefits of climate change, you know, it's not all costs. For example, agricultural productivity is actually higher with, with global warming. <coughs> and my, when I was on the plane uh, coming here uh, to South Korea, there was an article at the Wall Street Journal written by two eminent scientists, uh, one of them at Princeton, and they argue that in a world's uh, many thousands of years ago, when the carbon dioxide concentration in the air was like, don't know how many thousands of times more than what we are experiencing now. The, the earth was much more populated with plants and greeneries, you know. So they thrive better in this type of world. The other thing they say is the greenhouse gas owners, the, the greenhouse owners of the plants, they, they, their trick to encourage the plant growth is to pump more carbon dioxide. So they were saying that it's not all 100% certain that it's all cost. Uh, that, that's the point. Eh? And of course, Singapore is worried about the opening of the, the Arctic area. You know, now the ice become melting. So a lot of ships can now go through, right? So, but, so they don't have to go through the Suez Canal and then down the Straits of Malacca and go to Singapore to reach the, the Asia part. Now they can go from the, this side in the, the, the Pacific, from the Atlantic straight to the Pacific. So they bypass all this. So uh, Singapore is rightly worried. Okay? But that's business concern. But in terms of, if you talk about uh, environmental concerns, well, the melting of the ice will create uh, shorter sh uh, shipping routes, right? Means less transportation costs, means less carbon emission, right? The other thing is 
people worry about resource scarcity. The opening of that is estimated that they're going to discover new resources in that region, undiscovered, trapped in the, in the ice and so on. So I'm just painting another picture. No, I'm not taking sides, but I think that we should evaluate both sides. This uniform cut I've talked about is not good because every country different priorities. This one I've talked about. Now, I think the last, very last part is I just tell you very quickly this damage schedules approach. <coughs> I don't know how many of you did environmental economics, but when you do valuation, one common technique is to use contingent valuation. Contingent valuation asks people how much are you willing to pay for things and to establish values. Now, if you go to poor countries, if you ask a farmer or uneducated people, the government is going to supply an irrigation project. How much are you willing to pay? They normally have difficulties in answer, answering this type of question because of the uh, difficulty. So I have proposed that instead of looking at contingent valuation, I just use the question of do, to the farmer, do you prefer X or Y? Now, people can usually choose. Do you prefer apples or oranges? They can tell I like apples better. They cannot tell how much, but they can tell one is preferred to the other. So this is called a pairwise comparison game. And the idea is that I can have a list of items which demands government budget to spend on. It could be environment, water pollution, air pollution, waste, and so on. So government has a limited budget. How to use this budget effectively, efficiently? One way is, apart from listening to the experts, why not ask people the priorities? And then rank, that, rank them. Now, by, by asking them, do you prefer this over this, this over this, two at a time, and then establish a scale. So a scale can be derived, and this scale simply tells you uh, how, how, by how much more one item is more important than the second item, by how much more is the second item more important than the third item, and so on. This scale is good because it tells you how much the government ought to care about one item over the other. If you don't have a scale, if you just ask people how much, uh, how would you rank one, two, three, four, five, and if they just put down, like in a marketing survey, I rank good number one, three, two, one. So all they will tell you is equidistant from each other, which also, we just tell the government, this is more important, this, this is more important, this, that's it. But if I do this proper ranking scale, a weightage is used, I can then tell the government <coughs> that uh, maybe the first one is, ought to be spent more, but the second and the third one, it doesn't really matter because the priority is about the same, you see, <coughs> and so on. Now, I did that for both Singapore and Bangkok looking at differences. And then that leads on to some policy suggestion. But I realized I can do not just uh, looking at uh, uh, environmental concerns. I can now compare uh, environmental goods versus non-environmental goods. For example, public finance, right? Government spends money on, uh, on uh, buildings. Government spends money on education. Government spends money on transport. But government also spends on environment. So now I can compare all this as well. So I'm uh, second paper that I'm developing, uh, just finished, uh, so looking at uh, public goods, different types of public goods, <coughs> using the same method. And then I can actually use this method and compare against the traditional cost contingent valuation. Because I can, I can ask this question, uh, government has $1 million okay, spending on, say, to fight air pollution. Then I can divide by number of people in the country. I get a per capita how much. Then I can go to the people and ask the people, would you prefer the money or would you prefer government to spend more to fight air pollution by one more level? And if I see that you choose not the money, but you prefer this, which means that the amount of money the government spent currently is below what they wanted, you see. So I can now use both money compared to goods. So I think this is a very simple method. <clears throat> and for those of you who are interested, well, uh, uh, my first paper was in Applied Economics, 2005, I think. Oh, okay, this one just gives you in the slides, right, uh, the, the papers that can be found. Okay, I think maybe I'll stop here. I want to end off by saying this important message, which is that uh, maybe because I'm a little bit biased, but I think all environmental problems are economic problems. And why I say so? Because environmental problems and issues <coughs> face or have the same characteristics 
as a normal type of goods, a normal kind of problem. Scarcity of resources, you need to make choices, and choices are trade-offs, and how best to make those choices that <coughs> maximize your utility, you use cost and benefit, right? So, trade-off, cost society. And the other thing is I want to emphasize is that because I'm convinced that a lot of the environmental problems are economic problems. Then the next question you ought to address is, to what extent can you use economic instruments to solve environmental problems? Right. This picture is a standard uh, textbook, which is the abatement cost that if you, if, you, if, you have, if you want to cut down pollution, then it costs you to cut down. If you don't cut down, then the damage from pollution is higher and higher and higher. Now, people always underappreciate this simple idea. Because if you look at the media, you look at public policy planners, public policy makers, they always say damage, pollution, terrible, and so on. But they're only focusing on only one, one cause. And that cause is the cause that pollution inflicts on society through health, labor productivity losses, and so on. But what they don't see is the cost to control this pollution. For example, government now has to spend more money to police the firms. Number two, maybe the cars on the road have to install new anti-pollution equipment devices, and so on. All this raises the cost to control pollution. So it's a balancing of these two costs that you result in optimal level of pollution control. So I think this optimal pollution is always underappreciated because they focus too much on the marginal damage cost. Oh, the other thing is that you look at Japan, I mean, I don't know if people have a career or so. They are quite energy efficient over the years. They become more and more energy efficient, their, their industry and so on and so forth. Now, if we are quite near this line already, you cut back pollution to so much up to here. Sure, there are some residue left that you can still gain right, from cutting back. But the cost is tremendous from doing that. People also fail to appreciate this simple economics idea. That, that take for example crimes. In like Singapore, the crime rate is very low. But yet, the policymakers and the citizens, we must control more crime. Sure, we can do it. And we can reduce more. But at what cost, right? At what cost? So this kind of marginal abatement uh, cost is often again underappreciated. Okay, I think I'll leave it there. Uh, this just tells you the latest paper I wrote about CBA comparing rich and poor countries. Uh, I think you can read from the, the slides. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any comments or questions. Or clarification. Uh, maybe I can write it for the work. Yes. My name is Yong Chong. Mm -hmm. I'm a faculty member here at the EIS. Uh, one of my main areas for my research and public activities about the environmental and green areas these days. And then I'm quite happy that actually you listed some of the key research areas that I've been involved in for the last 10 years. So thank you very much for that. Um, I think. Uh, um, I've been looking at some of the uh, key uh, issue areas that uh, not only you but also uh, academic uh, yep. you know, people, also students may, may you know, take a look at. And then, then uh, I see, even if I have seen uh, several interesting points, but I want to point out one thing. Uh, in the context you're comparing between the bottom of and top of courses, I just uh, published a book uh, about a few days ago, mm -hmm. which, which, title, which is for 2020, Climate Change Ready Information. Okay. The theme of this book is to institutionalize the bottom approach uh, mm -hmm. of climate economics into the form of post-2020 climate change negotiation. Okay. I've been receiving already good response from the climate change ambassadors mm -hmm. of other countries. Mm -hmm. I'm waiting for your country's climate change ambassador. Okay. I'm uh, quite close to, to your climate change ambassador in the negotiation. Okay. So uh, you said that uh, uh, traditional, I would say, if I try to interpret what you said, of 
approach of using top-down approach meaning that uh, imposing legally binding obligations to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to countries, mm -hmm. in this case, NX1 countries, uh, may not work, so uh, it might be appropriate for the future, in the future to utilize a bottom approach. Um, I think that uh, that's true. Uh, but I think uh, there are some uh, good evidences that uh, where we can see already some similar progress in the regard. Mm -hmm. um, for example, in my case, I've been looking at the uh, uh, abatement cost curve version 2.1 of the Kenzie. Uh, that's a uh, controversial in terms of theoretical matter, mm -hmm. but that has been uh, bringing it, uh, serious uh, impacts uh, to the policy world. So basically, uh, and then also we have some similar models on our call and others from our EA. Yes. And then, then, then already con uh, countries, governments uh, recognize the importance of the country level focus, the efforts by focusing on the uh, energy efficiency and renewable and other green technologies. Mm -hmm. Based on that, uh, we can uh, actually encourage states to grow the economy mm -hmm. as a result we can reduce mm -hmm. greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. The question is the how we can actually coordinate all different kinds of national level of behaviors at the global level. Mm -hmm. I think that's what I think currently UNHCC is working on. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying here is that okay, bottom approach uh, is also has been taken seriously yep. uh, by the government, mm -hmm. also in other disciplines as well. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, if we look at law, then then, then including myself, uh, we don't necessarily look at imposing uh, concrete one the single uh, treaty through which we can impose legally binding obligations. Right. Rather, I've been looking at for for the last 15 years, how to utilize a market-based approach into the form of institutions or building governments. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, there are pretty good room mm -hmm. where we can actually work together. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that you mm -hmm. can emphasize the importance of the bottom approach. Mm -hmm. I think that that's number one. Um, I'm going to very, uh, um, Looking at the uh, East Asia in general, including Southeast Asia and Northeast Asia, this is a very interesting reason uh, mm -hmm. from my point of view to see how to, you know, make progress in, in regional integration. Mm -hmm. And we've been seeing totally different two pictures in some, one in South Asia and the other in Northeast Asia. Yep. Simply looking at the haze problem, mm -hmm. and I know the ASEAN concluded regional really to address that. Yep. Whereas uh, we have a lot of problem here, up here, but uh, I've been telling the governments, and not only in my country, but also Japan and China, that uh, it will be almost impossible for countries to conclude the regional <coughs> treaty to address the lot of problems because of some distinctiveness of this reason. Yep. This reason doesn't have any single mortality treaty at all, except the one that has been concluded a few years ago in the investment field. Yep. So, uh, uh, I've been looking at the, uh, some of the similarities and differences in, in East Asia in general, but mm -hmm. I was wondering, this is a question, as an economist, mm -hmm. economists don't like the uh, sovereign border, <laughs> because this can uh, destroy the sort of efficiency mm -hmm. that you can propose to, to the society. But how would you be able to interpret, if you have any model that you can rely on, the differences or similarities mm -hmm. of the, you know, in these two different sub regions in Asia, in dealing with uh, similar problem environment issues. In mm -hmm. other words, are you suggesting that as an economist, would it be more efficient for East Asia as a whole to develop the, uh, you know, sort of you know, large scale of institutions or governance through which we can address the issues mm -hmm. together, or mm -hmm. would you feel something different, uh, you know? terms of the methodology, in terms of way mm -hmm. to we mm -hmm. pursue the cooperation among mm -hmm. the countries because you also emphasize the cooperation in, in your mm -hmm. presentations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you. Well, uh, thank you for your comments. The, the, first, uh, co the first comment that you have made regarding the work that's been done on the bottom-up approach and, and, and so on, I think that it's not like it's when the multilateral treaties uh, discussion first started, there was a lot of focus on the top-down approach rather than this bottom-up. And this bottom-up approach gained momentum uh, of, of late, these recent years. And I think uh, increasingly quite a number of economists and political scientists 
has started to favour this kind of uh, a bottom-up approach. But that does not mean, of course, that we cannot still pursue the top-down approach uh, where it is applicable for you know, uh, maybe for certain things, not necessarily dealing with carbon emissions, but they can do for other things as well, which actually works quite good. Take, for example, the Montreal Protocol, the old, uh, you know, the, those type of gases, CFC gases. Uh, carbon emission is much more complicated uh, because it involves more than just uh, one type of particular usage of gas. But all I'm saying is that the two approaches can actually try to coexist, but a system of penalties, a system of rewards, a system of uh, building capacities sent, uh, spent by the richer nations to help the poor countries, uh, that could all be uh, instituted in such a way that we actually encourage more of this bottom-up approach uh, uh, to, uh, for, for, for many countries. The second one has to do with uh, sovereignty issues. Right? Transboundary problem, transboundary issues or, mm, is, is nothing, just like carbon emission, the global warming, it's actually special cases of externalities. So if you go back to the literature on economics of externalities, it's actually, it's actually the same thing. It says this is more select. So transboundary involve, uh, uh, usually the way we define it is between a few countries. Uh, then you have the global one in many countries, so you have the global warming. Uh, and as I said, uh, in the transboundary issue, the complication is that in a domestic issue, domestic uh, externality problem, you can solve it because you have the instruments to solve it and you have the power of the courts and the law to back you up and the enforcement. Once it involves outside your country, you have a sovereignty issue, then these domestic instruments cannot apply. And the only instruments that you can apply is therefore the international agreements through negotiations. Uh, in one of my papers, I talked about the involvement of a third party. So the way it works is like this. It's simplified, but I think uh, we are trying to develop it a bit more. And the idea is, suppose, suppose we have this uh, haze problem between Indonesia and Singapore. All right? Let's take these two countries. So Indonesia is a perpetrator, although it's also suffering from the haze, but let's say uh, the, the, the victim is Singapore. Now, let us say that because of sovereignty issues, Singapore, not, nothing Singapore can do to effect a solution from Indonesia. But Singapore has ties with a third party, could be Philippines. I'm just giving you a hypothetical example. So Singapore may have ties with a third party, and that third party has also ties with Indonesia. Now, it could be that the third party has a lot more ties with Singapore, and therefore a lot more to lose <coughs> if Singapore were to re reduce the ties compared to that third party with Indonesia. So definitely the third party wants to help Singapore because they are, he's being threatened that if you don't do anything to help, to moderate, to, and to talk with the Indonesians, right, to leverage on the Indonesians, then, then nothing could happen. But this Indonesia and the third party, Indonesia may have a lot of dependence on the third party. So that could be another form of negotiation there and therefore effecting a solution through a third party. The question is, of course, one has to compare. Uh, uh, you have to search for the right third party. You have to monitor the costs involved as well, right, and make the solutions. So this I've talked about it in, in other places, but it's in a very simplified uh, model at, at, at this point in time. Um, I am not so sure what else that we can really do apart if, if there are no threats involved, if there's no economic threat, no political threat involved. I'm not so sure whether we can effect a solution. Take the ASEAN Treaty Haze that you talked about. Is it a success? I'm not so sure because Indonesia themselves have not signed and ratified that treaty. That was the, the, the treaty to, to, to deal with the Haze problem. And the treaty has been around for quite some time. And is it the best way to solve? Well, in the, in the current context, the with the absence of the ratification of the treaty, both Malaysia and Singapore have come to the conclusion that, well, there's really nothing we can really do. So, but if we don't do anything, the damages to us is quite substantial and may increase over time. So what we have to do is to calculate what our damages are, know what they are, and then try to reduce those damages by bribing the Indonesians. Now, how does a state bribe the other state? Well, 
Bribing meaning, well, you can contribute money or you can contribute non-money. So they have decided to do actually both. Uh, some, some money to help uh, the Indonesian government and that money is then used to help the local provincial government and that in turn money is used to reduce the fires in the local provinces. And the other one that they, are, they have thought of is the non-money, which is Malaysia sends firefighters to Indonesia. Singapore uses satellite technology to try to locate where the fire is and then try to inform the Indonesian government so that they can quickly act on quashing the, the fires before it becomes too big. Now, they have gone a step further, meaning that Malaysia and Indonesia has become adopted parents to two provinces in Indonesia. So they have selected the two provinces. They have gone in to advise the governments of the two provinces to try to reduce this frequency of the fires. Now, can more be done? I'm sure there can more be done. But problem again is not sovereignty again. It's the Indonesians themselves. So they have different uh, ability to coordinate their, their, their machinery of government. So who is responsible ultimately to control the fire? Is it the forestry department? Is it the, the legal department? Is it the provincial government? Is it the federal government? So there are all these problems that if you don't sort out within internally, how are they going to actually rectify that treaty? Because that rectifying means they are committed to certain things. Yeah. So it's a lot of complicated issues. And I will not be able to tell you what is the solution because the whole world is trying to find a solution. But the solution must lie in an agreed form of international negotiation and agreement backed up by what we call a subsidy payment or compensatory payment. That is the only solution. But I don't have the answer to you. If I have, I, I would solve everything. <coughs> Are there any other questions or comments? Yeah, I do have a question about the uh, price mechanism for green products. Price mechanism yeah, for, price Korean, mechanism for, for Korean goods. Products, yes. okay. um, which I definitely need to price green commodities. But do you have any special criteria? Well, we have, you mean methods, we do have. I did not invent the methods. We teach but them. You said the old methods have limitations. So oh. to judge the, uh, yeah, okay. the good, That's good methodology. Well, basically, um, the methods are whether it's a review preference or stated preference, right? And in, this, in the literature, in within each of these approaches, there are several other methods. So the question is, when you look at the local example, can you adapt some of these? Take for example, uh, travel costs. I don't know whether you're familiar, but travel costs is a well-known technique used to price parks and recreation. It started in the United States and Harold Hotelling was actually the first person to write about the travel cost method in an unpublished letter to the United States government. And subsequently, the method we all learn is uh, from uh, John Hopkins Press, published by Marion Clausen from Resources for the Future, and Professor Jack Nash, uh, who was working at, uh, at George Washington University. And actually, unknown, unknown to these two researchers, they actually produced the same method as Harold Hotelling did in an unpublished letter. And the method is basically that in the absence of prices, people travel to the parks. So why can't we try to measure and estimate what is the travel cost to get to the park? And because of the distance, the travel cost uh, would be different for, for people coming from different region, different town, right? And so there is, they take the travel cost as a proxy for price, right? And therefore they can build a, a demand schedule whereby changes in the price is approximated by changes in the travel cost. And then uh, they can include time costs into it as well. So this, this and, and then in terms of theory, the value of anything is the area under the demand curve. So if you can get the demand curve, you can get the area, and you, that's the value, okay? Now, that is the simple mechanics of the travel cost. Now, in, in Singapore, some of the officers who actually, some ministry officers who actually learned this method from my course, went back to the ministry and started to use the travel cost to price 
some parks in Singapore. But then they immediately, they know it cannot work. Why it cannot work? Because Singapore is not like US, not like South Korea. Because your parks are far. Singapore, no matter where you go, is near. So they cannot get enough variation in the travel cost to get the demand curve. So what they get is a point along dotted bunch in one spot. And so they realize this is a failure. You cannot use travel costs. So while travel costs is, is a well-known method used and taught in environmental economics to price uh, parks and recreation, which is a green good, which is a non-market good, it cannot work for certain uh, circumstances, right? So uh, my point is saying all this is that, well, we have to pick and choose some of the non-market techniques, which one is best to apply to your own local circumstances. And in a very poor country, obviously you cannot use explicit or stated preferences like contingent valuation because people cannot understand. So you have to resort to a simpler method. And then because of that, I was motivated to develop the damage schedules approach. Yeah. Um, I'm from Germany. And yes. Maybe explains why I'm not a big fan of nuclear energy. Okay. <laughs> I just, I'm just wondering and I'm a little bit worried that we see in East Asia not really a tendency towards, or not, not a very fast tendency towards um, energy change, towards renewable energies. Um, instead, what is being done is that Korea now builds uh, half a dozen new nuclear plants, basically, and in China, 15 new plant, and I don't know about Singapore and other countries. So basically, um, this is, we get relatively low energy costs today. Mm -hmm but we postpone the, the cost to future generations mm. because the risk of nuclear energy are tremendous as we saw in, mm. uh, in Japan now. Mm. So basically we are living again uh, on the cost of, of future generations. Yeah? Just replacing CO2 emissions by, by another bad thing, by, by nuclear energy. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, how can we accelerate the process of energy change in Asia? Mm -hmm. That's my question. Okay. Now, this is a highly sensitive uh, always debated issue, nuclear power or non-nuclear power. For some countries, like in the case of Singapore, we are renewable energy deficient. We don't have hydropower, we don't have uh, wind power, we, and there are lots of sun around us, but unfortunately, the latest technology to harness the solar energy is insufficient and they provide only like 5% of Singapore's total needs per day. Um, so we, we just do not have renewable energy, even if we really want renewable energy. So, and unfortunately for Singapore, I'm just taking the case of Singapore, nuclear power energy, can we afford to tamper with nuclear power in case something happened? Singapore is too small a country, you can't go anywhere to escape, right? So we have a big problem. So what do we do? Uh, Singapore is very dependent on natural gas. Now we've been getting our natural gas primarily from Indonesia, shipped uh, by pipeline. The problem is reliability. The second problem is political stability. What happens if they cut our natural gas, cut the pipeline? Then what do we do, right? So Singapore has diversified by buying liquefied natural gas. So they have this shipment from uh, Europe right, coming all the way by big containers to Singapore to supply the natural gas at very high cost. But we are prepared to do that in order to diversify our dependence, over-dependence on one country, which is Indonesia. Um, but we have started to, to play models on nuclear power station. Where do we put it? We can't put on the main island. We may have to look for another island, a small fishing village somewhere deep into the sea, then have a modern technology to contain it, right? A lot of risk involved, no doubt. So when it comes to this type of situation, uh, what is the best solution? Do we do nothing? I understand all these nuclear power things that you refer to, the, the race and the future generation, but I'm not so sure where we can get uh, a, a, an easy solution. And I mean, Singapore is now an extreme case because yeah. Right. But the other Asian countries... Oh, fine, fine. But let's look at Japan. Japan, well, they, they shut because of the incident in Fukushima. 
they, uh, people get very worried. And then I understand from many academicians there, people have just lost the uh, objectivity by looking at the probabilities and so on, right? And sure, mistakes are made as well, but you learn from those mistakes and you become much better in the future. So that, that is what they, they hope. And what happened that after they shut down all the nuclear power station, they become energy deficient, right? And many of them complain that uh, they just don't have enough power to, to power up uh, the needs of Japan. So you can say, why don't you cut down those needs? Uh, sure, you can do that as well. But then something got to give to cut down all those needs too, right? So there's, what do you do? I think Abe is trying to restart back the nuclear power. The other one is in Europe, right? I think uh, Germ Germany, your country, uh, I think it was, uh, she, she declared facing out everything, right? Yeah, everything. everything, right? Yeah. But I'm not so sure this effectually will be imp implemented because it's very high cost to get alternative energies to maintain the level which Germany needs. Unless Germany starts say, I don't need that level, I start cutting back. But again, something has to give. So I'm just saying, so we all know that there's always these trade-offs. If a society is prepared to accept the trade-off, then I have no problem, as long as you know what are the trade-offs. But if you just say, I don't care, I just uh, want to cut this back, and I, I want to protect the future generation, then that society must live with that decision. I'm not so sure the future generation uh, will be happier, you know, because that might mean less material goods for them. They might have more, a lot of green goods around them, but less material goods. I'm not so sure. The green goods are getting cheaper and cheaper. <laughs> like solar panels are getting, are losing. The it. technology, so the yeah, sure, sure. are reducing by sure. 10% a year. So it's really that right. going down. Like, of course, I'm also a big fan of technology. I think people tend to underestimate technology in the far future. Something may happen that will reduce the price substantially, and therefore that will alleviate a lot of this burden. I don't have gain no solution, but I'm just telling you that as an economist, I always believe trade-offs, that we have to make choices. Thank you very much. Thank you.